Hello, Saginaw Valley. My name is Mark Lyons. I'm a technology integration specialist for Bay Aranac ISD. And I'm Katie Butsu. I'm an occupational therapist, and I'm also the assistive technology coordinator at Bay Aranac ISD. And we're here to talk to you today about switch accessibility. So assistive technology, as you've been learning throughout your class, is any piece, uh, any item, any piece of equipment, a product, and this can either be acquired, whether it's commercially made or customized specific to the individual's needs. Um, this can look like a variety of things, whether it's low tech all the way up to high tech. And so today we're gonna focus on switches and how switches can um, allow someone independence, whether that be through play participation, communication, um, and a variety of switches, mounting systems, and where OT fits in with all of this. So when we look at a switch, a switch is, um, works like an on off button. So it connects it to a battery operated toy um, or electrical appliance. This can look like an environmental control unit and it allows someone to safely and independently turn it on or off. So like this boy is in the picture, he's using what we call a Big Mac switch, what we're gonna get into in just a little while. And this is allowing him access to um, something within his environment um, using just um, gross motor skills to be able to access the switch. So when I was in the classroom, uh, I used to have uh, individuals and, and young students use switches all the time. It might have been their first time to have independence with maybe turning on a lamp in our classroom, or it might have been them using a switch to uh, communicate with the pair of pros or, or the teachers that are in the classroom. So again, like Katie said, switches are pretty much just an on and off uh, switch for multiple things. And so when we look at switches, we're looking at what movement does the individual have, how much strength does they have, do they have, how much range of motion. So we're looking at all of those um, underlying skills that would allow someone to access the switch and then looking at what they are trying to access within their environment. So as OTs, we definitely are focusing on independence and promoting equal um, access for individuals. So you can see in this picture what this is allowing is actually right on the tabletop where that black and gray, um, that's actually a switch and that's um, a light touch joystick. And so what that allows someone to do is allows them to minimally apply pressure um, and it's hooked up to what we call a power link. So that's going to be the blue um, rectangle that's over there in the corner. And that actually allows anything that's um, power operated. So something that has to plug in. So they've got the sewing machine and that allows someone to become an active participant in sewing. So an individual who maybe doesn't have the fine motor coordination, whether that be after a stroke or um, an injury and this, they aren't able to access the use of a sewing machine that this now would allow them that opportunity. Yeah, in this power switch right here, this one has different dials, so you can uh, set it to different times. Uh, I, I believe this one that we have here is um, has four uh, outlets there. Yeah, and so there's when he's saying that there's different options on there, there's what we call a direct um, access, so that would mean you hit the switch and then it turns it on, so just like an on-off, like if you're turning the light switch, it's on or off in a, um, a room. Um, there's also what we call like a time lapse, and so what that would mean is if you, an individual hits the switch, it would be on for about five to 10 seconds, depending on how long before it actually resets. So that allows, especially if someone has like slower processing, things like that, it allows them that time to build an understanding of what the switch is actually doing for that cause and effect. Um, so I always like to include this video. So this is from um, the Super Bowl a couple years ago. Um, so my, some of you may have seen it before. Um, and what this is, is this is actually a commercial for Microsoft when they came out for with their adapted um, gaming control. And I think this is cool because this is actually an occupational therapist by the name of Eric Johnson, who I personally know really well from um, past AOTA conferences and um, several years back, I got to bring him um, on board for our soda conference, which was awesome. So he is, um, his past is um, working out in the military. And so he had seen that when um, individuals were obtaining um, an amputation or an injury, that their number one thing that they wanted to get back to was video gaming. And so what he did is he made that um possible for them through a variety of um, switches and adapted gaming controllers. And so he's actually on um, part of the team that had created this. So I'm going to go ahead and show the commercial. And this is going to just kind of help to set the tone for today to show um, how a switch can allow someone access to something that's so meaningful. 
So right now we have this young man running through the neighborhood and they kind of emphasize everybody's using, you know, fine motor skills. Like these kiddos are playing hockey and I think the next kiddo is going to be doing some type of, yeah, he's using a, a typical game controller. So they're all hanging over to their friend's house. This young man is playing the piano. But when this first came out, when the you know the, the first time we saw it on the, during the Super Bowl, it was a, a maybe one of the first times that you know the masses got to see that um, you know adapted game controllers are were even a thing. So this is uh, a beautiful commercial right here, and it's got a great message at the end. <laughs> It's a tearjerker. <laughs> awesome. All right, so next we're looking at how do I know what type of switch I need? So when you look at switches online, you're gonna see a variety of switches, like I had said. Um, you might see something that looks like this. You might see something that looks up there like this. You might see something that's as complex as um, a sip and puff blow switch, meaning that someone is using breath support to be able to access their switch. Um, but when we look at um, switches and we're looking, like I said, at those underlying abilities that the individual has. So we're looking at their range of motion. We're looking at their motor control. We're looking strength because all of these things are going to play into the piece of access and that's really where OT helps to fit in with a lot of um, switch accessibility as well as AAC or augmentative and alternative communication which we're going to touch on a little bit in this presentation as well today. Um, so um, Katie I'm going to have you hold those up one more time I'm going to try to zoom in on you so they can see it a little bit better and just show them like the, the, the back end of it because I, there's some adapters that they might have questions about. Yeah, so when we get in a couple slides in, I'm going to go touch a little bit more on what each of these um, are and what they do. But this one's actually just what we call a Big Mac switch. And a Big Mac switch is probably going to be your most common that you see online. But this one actually um, has voice output as well. So when you're looking on this list of um, what type of switch um, is needed or what the user specifically will need, we also want to think about those sensory components. So um, if an individual is more visually impaired, um, they might need voice output to actually know where where the switch is something along that same line. and i'm sorry to stop you uh tell us why there's a, there's a little piece of velcro on top of that um when i first started uh student teaching i always wondered why why was there velcro right on top of the big mac switch yeah so ablenet um which is the creator of the switch they've actually come out with a new program which is pretty cool they came out with overlays that go right they are customized so they fit right underneath the switch cover and what that would mean, like, so for example, if you're targeting, you're using the switch to indicate that someone wants more of something. So for example, bubbles, the individual might be at the level where they're learning cause and effect or those basic communication signs. So the Velcro is just going to be to um, put a picture um, to help build an understanding of if I hit the switch, this is what I'm going to get in return. Um, so it helps to promote that exchange it, between. Yeah, and a lot of times uh, when I first started in the classroom, we would have a switch of a preferred and a non-preferred. So we had a very good baseline of if the student really knew what switch did what uh, action. And that's a good point because it helps to learn if they can discriminate between more than one um, thing. So we want to think about that as well as the visual components that go into that. Back to the um, sensory components that go along with switches, there's also switches that are out on the market that provide a little bit more um, sensory input. So this one's got like bumpy switch. There's ones that are out that are more squishy. So um, thinking too about um, giving them that tactile um, input as well. Um, Katie, do you want me to jump back into the slides here? Yeah. Okay, here we go. All right, so a lot of the switches that I had just mentioned are commercially made switches, obviously. And so I just linked um, a couple of the websites that we um, personally purchase a lot of our devices from, and they're probably the most common. Um, so there's enabling devices, AbleNet, and then eSpecial Needs. And um, there's not one that's better than the other, but these are going to be where you can locate a lot of these switches um, and why you would use them. So they do a nice job of kind of like targeting, you know, all of our Big Mac switches are in this area. If someone has impaired strength, you might want to go with this one because it allows the um, user to access it with a little bit lighter pressure. So the Big Mac switch, like I had mentioned before, that was um, this first one that we had showed. This one actually, though, is um, a communicator. One so specific, like I said, does offer sound. Um, so 
you, I could do a recording on this. So I might say more. And then when the individual accesses the switch, it would provide that voice output. Um, some switches also offer another type of sensory feedback that is um, vibration. You can see on this Big Mac switch, um, it actually has the plug. So um, that allows that switch to be plugged into anything that's switch adapted. So when we talked about, like I said, switch adapted toys, um, that would be something that would be um, compatible with that power link that allows someone to access something that plugs in like a blender, or like a light switch, uh, or I'm sorry, like a light um, or a lamp, um, anything that is needs to be plugged in. However, with the times, um, progressing and different things that are out on the market. There's also Bluetooth switches, which I personally have probably used the most right now. Um, so I have personally a couple of kiddos that are switch users that are on our virtual platform this year with everything with COVID. And so this is a Bluetooth switch. And what this allows the individual to do is access something through Bluetooth. So for example, they can control their computer screen um, using the click um, option on the computer screen. So for example, they might participate in a video game and their switch um, actually becomes like their computer mouse um, their con and controls it that way. This also is a nice one because it acts as an interface. So it becomes basically the middleman. So it allows you to actually put external switches like the Big Mac. So you could um, put they'll plug those in and then allows them still access to something used via Bluetooth. So Katie, just uh, so everybody knows, like these are things that we can hook up to our phones or iPads, correct? If, if it's a smartphone or, or a smart tablet. Correct. So um, I believe I included those in our slides today, but if not, um, something we can go into is any de um, Apple device or Android device has the um, compatibility to be able to use external switches. And this would be one of them. So like we said, it's just going to use Bluetooth um, capability to match up with your phone. And then that can, you can program this. So for example, if you're doing this on an iPad, you could use the yellow or the left switch to access the volume up and then the white to be volume down. So you could teach an individual how a switch works through um, an interactive activity that way. So what we're trying to tell you, every smart device has like a, after you go on, in, I think settings in general, there's a accessibility uh, tab in there and there's all sorts of options. Um, and a lot of those do not get utilized. So um, once you start to explore those, it's, it's, a, it's a game changer. All right, so looking at this next switch, this is just a pressure switch and you can see um, I also have one here. And so what this allows is it actually has some strapping and this would just be placed in the individual's hand. Um, you can also use this as a head switch. Um, it can be mounted a variety of different ways, but what this allows the user to do is very minimally, they need to apply pressure. And then you can see that she has the port just like I do. And then this would get plugged into your switch accessible toy or game or um, the like a power link or any interface system. So you can see that. So then this would go ahead and be activated to turn on the toy. And I think we're gonna get into uh, how that toy has that adapter later on, I believe. So the next piece that we wanna to touch base on, we're gonna get a lot um, more into switches and um, different switches that are both on the market and then switches that can be made further in this presentation. But I really want to talk about mounting. So this is a part that often gets overlooked. But if we look at a switch and it can be the most perfect switch on the market or it could be great in one position for an individual. But the minute that we move them, they can't reach it or they can't um, they don't have the control anymore, then we've kind of lost their access mode. So we wanna look at mounting, that's gonna really help um, bridge the gap for a lot of individuals. So we look at how are they able to access the switch in a variety of environments, but then also in a variety of positions, because like you and I, we're not always standing, we're not always sitting. And so these individuals, maybe they're um, then all of a sudden in their bed, can they still access their switch? Because that might be their form of communication um, or their um, access point for their communication device. And so we want to make sure that mounting is looked at. And just one thing I... I, I... I may have forgot to say, uh, we are talking mostly about students right now, you know, K through 12th grade, but um, we also have a lot of uh, individuals that may work 
and you know they never really needed uh, these types of things in you know when they were younger. So uh, just keep that in mind when when we're talking about all of this. So last year, Mark and I had the um, opportunity to come out to Saginaw Valley and we got to host a really fun switch hackathon day. Um, but unfortunately with COVID, we know that that's kind of looking different this year. So I will be joining um, your class in April and we're gonna be um, diving a little bit more deeply into um, using what we call a makey makey as a switch and some of those builds as well as I'm gonna bring out a lot of the products that we're talking about today so that you guys can get some hands-on experience but um, we do want to touch base on what switch adapting toy looks like and how to obtain the different um, resources needed to be able to do so. So when we look at switch adapting toys, um, we want to break down really why are we doing that. So ultimately it's because an individual doesn't have access to um, play. Maybe that's um, they can't access the toy because there's too many fine motor components on it. Um, this is going to allow someone the independence and to allow them to be an active participant. So I, I will say this as a clinician, and I think I'm guilty of this, and every other therapist I probably know out there is guilty of this, but we often um, struggle with individuals, maybe if they have cerebral palsy or um, any other neurological or cognitive delay that um, they might struggle with access. So for example, um, what comes to mind is an individual with cerebral palsy and they might have a lot of tone um, and they might not have the skills to be able to um, play at what we think is age appropriate of like a 13 year old. But what we see is, okay, well, they're able to do like a star stacker toy or they're more at the cause and effect level. So I'm going to go get this light up toy that I would get out for a six month old. And absolutely not. Like I know that a 13 year old boy does not want to be playing with a star stacker. And so we really have to um, be mindful of that. And although that their cognitive abilities might not match um, that of what their um, play skills are currently at, or um, their physical abilities might not match the activity that's more age appropriate, but really how do we bridge that gap? So switches are an awesome way to be able to make the individual an active participant within the activity. So who? So we've talked a lot about more like those physical um, disabilities that um, can play into this, but there's also um, the developmental and cognitive components as well. So it's any individual who's struggling with operating um, an age appropriate toy um, or activity. So on this, we're really honing in on toys because we're going to talk about toy hacking. Um, but some of those physical challenges might not just be limited to impaired strength or coordination, but it might mean that they're born with a deformity. Um, and so maybe they were born with a congenital amputee and they don't have access to be able to use their alternative arm. So um, this might be the first time that they have gain access because of that. Um, you can see in this picture, this little boy has what we call like that flexor synergy going. And so um, obviously he probably would struggle to squeeze something on the Tickle Me Elmo, but the switch is allowing him um, to be an active participant and play with it that way. Um, also individuals with visual impairments. So they might struggle to see um, the toy or presented activity, um, but maybe using a tactile type switch or a switch that offers that vibration for feedback would allow them to access the toy. And Katie, I wanted to go back to the, the why for a second. Um, I, I believe Saginaw Valley has a program where they take a Barbie car or uh, a motorized battery car and they adapt it to fit uh, a, a child that is maybe three or four um, so they can use a joystick to control the car. That's, that's, that's really fun for the student and kind of like age appropriate. Also teaches that student, um, if they're getting into like a $10,000 wheelchair, um, it's, it's better to get used to that joystick in a toy plastic car before they move on to a very expensive uh, piece of uh, uh, equipment. Yeah, and we're gonna show that a little bit later on. Um, it's like the Go Baby Go. And I, I believe it's, yeah, like the robotics teams have partnered with a lot of um, Saginaw Valley's programming um, for STEM and things like that on um, creating those. So it's awesome. Um, so next we're going to look at the why. So switches, when we think of, I said, like I said, a lot of um, access, but it's also teaching a variety of skills. So it can be used for social skills. So if an individual um, doesn't have the ability to communicate, um, switches can be a form of communication. It can also um, give them access to a communication device. So I am going to show a couple of those. So 
um, back when iPads came out, it really, I think AAC or alternative and communication really kind of took off because a lot of um, individuals obtained more access to it. So iPads are a pretty cheap device overall. Um, and a lot of the software that is used out on the market can be downloaded on an iPad or an Android dev device. Um, but there are things that are out on the market this, that are more what we call like mid tech. And so this is using what we call LAMP um, Words for Life, which is um, one of the software systems that we use quite a bit for individuals. Um, but what this would could do is this is ultimately a switch for communication. So it um, provides a visual and then when the individual pushes for example like good they'll go ahead and push down and they'll say good it'll give them that voice output but maybe the individual doesn't have the skill to be able to isolate and push down on the buttons on that then something like this a switch might be what's used to help as an interface or that in between um, to give them access to their communication device and the communication device that Katie was just showing there um, that's just a sheet that slides under there you, you can create you know the icon and she was talking about a, a certain program there's also another company called Logan Tech and they've actually made tiles where you can program the tiles and they, they use velcro to put back and on um, so as you know as we move through this Technology becomes more of a, uh, you know, useful piece for uh, assistive technology. And so um, ultimately, too, in addition to social skills. So when we think about social skills or um, participation in, in play, that can allow them that turn taking. So like my turn, your turn, or it might allow them to um, participate in a back and forth play exchange activity with somebody. Um, it promotes cause and effect. It helps to build that understanding. So if I do this, I get this. So a lot of like noisy toys, a lot of light up toys are used to help really with those um, pre skills to switch accessibility and the initial learning of that um, it helps with motor planning. So they, they have to be able to plan the movements to be able to approximate where is my switch? How am I going to access it? Um, it helps with, like I said, building that sensory awareness, whether they're getting some visual output from the toy sound output. Um, tactile input from the switch um, and it's really just ultimately going to enhance their learning enhance their play participation enhance language a variety of skills and one of the things we do not have a slide for but we always like try to bring up um it's you know teaching the individual that needs the assistance but it's also extremely important to teach the peers whether they're in elementary or high school or or whatever level they're at to teach people around them what that device does because sometimes that takes the the fear away or the wonder um, and it's just uh, extremely helpful when everybody knows why they're using that. Um, so again with the why um, it helps with development of and helping with individuals with cognitive challenges or delays so it helps to build an understanding like I said with that um, cause and effect but then further when he was mentioning like the use of multiple switches so it helps to build an understanding like if I use my red switch, it's going to tell me no. If I use my green switch, it's going to tell me yes. If I am building up to like a variety of a field of four switches, so maybe one has bubbles, one means that I get the toy. Um, it's just going to help really build those understanding of if I do this, I will get this. So um, continuation um, and de developmentally, as you want to grow those skills, you can continue to expand on that. So this is one of my favorite slides to show people because um, we always talk about toy hacking and um, right now I believe there's like a little bit of a monopoly on the special ed market or on the AT uh, market because the, the Elmo on the left comes with an adapter. It has an adapter switch and uh, Katie's going to show it to you. Let me uh, bring, it, bring the screen over so you can see her I'm showing this. Yeah, there it is. So I just brought another um, commercially made toy. So this is a penguin race. And I don't know if you guys can see that very well, but what this does is it actually has the um, output for um, a switch to be plugged into it. And um, by doing so, um, then the child can use the switch and the little penguins go up the game and kind of slide down. But something like this is very, very expensive on the market. A lot of the toys are well into like the hundreds. And, and that one right there, um, there's, so there's been some devices that we purchased um, so just so we could take them apart and figure out how the company did it. The only thing that really has in it is a battery interrupter and it's got the on and off switch glued. So it's on, on all the time. So when I go back to the slide here, um, let me, let me bring it full size. The Elmo that you can just buy off of Amazon. It's the same one. 
It's $18.99, and all we did was use like a $6 battery interrupter. And we're going to be talking about battery interrupters here in a little bit. But there's a huge like price markup here. Um, but with you all learning this knowledge, you can definitely save um, you know, your clients, your families uh, a ton of money. Yeah, and so I always think too, like especially um, my background is primarily was outpatient um, pediatrics and neuro, and then I also now I've been in the schools for about three years, and so when we look at someone's exposure to a lot of this, like in an outpatient setting, I was seeing my kiddos forty-five minutes twice a week, so an hour and a half out of the entire week, and then we look at in the schools, and that's even reduced even more, and so. Um, sometimes the only access that those kids have to it or exposure that they have is within their outpatient setting or within the school setting. And then they get home and they don't have any switch accessible toys. Um, also working in an area where um, financial components are an, you know, an issue um, you know, with a low income economic status, we look at that and a lot of these toys are well above and beyond um, what they're worth, unfortunately, for a family. Like they, you know, a toy kid, is like, okay, I'm over that toy and want to move, wants to move on to the next toy. Well, they might have spent well over $100 on one single toy. Um, but when we look at um, switch accessibility and toy hacking, this might be able to provide a child with so many more toys for the same um, price and then also give them access to those um, toys at home um, within their normal environment outside of school or outside of outpatient. So I think the next thing we're going to be talking about is the toy hacking. Um, so this is a solder pen. Um, they're, they're pretty cheap. You can get them off of Amazon. Um, here's the pen. This is the part that heats up. You just plug it in. Um, this is where the pen goes when it's hot. This is just a sponge. You get the sponge wet, and that's how you clean your sponge off. Um, the, the skill of soldering is just to do it and practice it. Um, it there's... There's no way, I mean, you can watch 100 videos, but until you actually really do it, um, that's when you get good at it. Uh, there's only a couple things you really have to like focus on. Uh, make sure you have some goggles on. Sometimes the, the solder does kind of spit and bubble up, so you want to protect your eyes. Um, do realize that this is extremely hot, and um, I guess the biggest thing that we've seen, like when you're using a solder pen, always put it back in the, the holder. We've had a couple times where people are soldering and then they set it down on the table and they totally forget that this is, you know, red hot and it touches something. And I, I, we you know we've had a couple of stuffed animals, you know, melted because it kind of starts touching the, the stuffed animal. Um, and the, the, the other thing is um, we always use lead free um, solder. It sounds like you guys will be getting the opportunity to do some of this in the classroom, which is exciting to hear. So um, we did include just the tutorial video. So you guys can look at that on your own time on how to do that. Um, but we had frequently had mentioned the word battery interrupter. So I really want to talk about what is a battery interrupter and how does that work? So um, similar to what we were talking about before, um, we're, I don't know if you guys can see. Let me, let me, uh, let me. A little bit closer so, that, so they can see. There so this go. guy was something that we had hacked. So you can kind of see where we had a slit open his wrist to be able to expose the wires. We soldered it and then we in, uh, included one of the ports to be able to plug in the switch. Um, but this required soldering. So if a toy has um, batteries and is battery operated, you can utilize what's called a battery interrupter. I will say that um, this is really good for um, toys that have a single switch. So for example, like a bubble blower, it's only intended to do one thing. So it's going to blow things out or like a battery operated fan. However, if this um, toy is like a leapfrog toy and it has batteries, but it has multiple switches, ultimately, it's not going to work because it's not going to, it's not just working on one switch. So battery interrupters are, um, commercially made on the market. You can get them from about $11, um, or you can make a battery interrupter using um, some copper tape. Um, and then also um, there's solder versus non-solder versions of battery interrupters. So I did include um, why you would use one, the cost for parts, and some of the links for creating your own. And just uh, before we go on the next slide, um, the, the stuffed animal that we had over there, um, we shopped at Goodwill. From Salvation Army, we found the right toys that we we were looking for. The ones that had the the switches in them already to work on our soldering skills. But um, the way to do it is just to practice on something that you're not probably going to give to somebody else, and make sure it works before you actually get onto like a toy that you're going to you know intend for somebody. 
And so next what we're going to do is we're going to kind of flip, switch gears in a little bit, and we were going to look at um, how us as occupational therapists um, can also be what we call a maker. So um, a lot of these products that we talked about were commercially made, but we can save individuals a ton of money in making those switches that were commercially made by actually creating the switches ourselves as well. So um, Makers Making Change, which we're going to talk a lot about today, um, is a nonprofit out of Canada. And we actually um, came across their information a couple of years ago now um, when I was looking for um, resources for 3D printing, what we call a universal cuff, which you guys might have learned about now. Um, and that allows someone to do is be able to hold a feeding utensil independently. Independently. Um, I had tried a couple commercial made ones and was spending quite a bit of money um, for this little guy I was working with who needed to be able to feed himself. And so I came across 3D print files and I didn't know anything about 3D printing other than it existed. And so I knew our ISD had um, access to a 3D printer. So what I did is I went ahead and I took the print file and I went ahead and sent it over to our guy that has access to that and he printed it within about an hour and a half and 17 cents later, we found a solution for the four-year-old that I was working with and he was able to independently feed himself um, just following demonstration of it. So it was super exciting, but I just kept wondering like, okay, well, why was their files free? Like, I don't understand anything about this. So I wanted to know more about them. So Mark and I had reached out to them. Um, and at the time they were just starting to really um, bring Makers Making Change into the US and really um, start to develop their chapter program, which we're gonna talk about. Um, so when we look at Makers Making Change, what it is, is it actually is an organization, it's a project that connects volunteer makers or people who like to build people who like to make um, so one, some of these soldering skills that you're going to be learning if you become really passionate about it or you want to be able to help more you can become um, a volunteer as well and so it uh, links the individual who is the maker and it connects to, it to an individual with a person who has a disability and is requesting a low cost AT device. And so they have a variety of um, switches as well as a lot of different forms of assistive technology that they have out in their um, open resources. And um, it, like I said, is going to help bridge that gap and allow someone to get a device at a lot less cost um, for the individual that's obtaining that. So. And the nice thing is um, here in Michigan, we have a ton of maker groups already established and they might not be making stuff for assistive technology, but they're always willing to help out or let you use their stuff. Um, Detroit has a gigantic um, maker fair every year. This year, of course, it was postponed. But um, if you ever get a chance to attend one of those maker fairs, you're going to meet some really interesting individuals and people that will... Um, definitely point you in the right direction if you're looking for assistive technology because it seems like they all just enjoy helping others and sharing um it's called open resources um yeah it's great and so when we look at um what is um an open source assistive technology so he kind of just mentioned that um it's basically a library of free design files um that have open source licenses so these individuals that are doing the research and development over at neil squire um, who are a part of um, the makers making change products actually um, assist assist with the designing and then they also help with the invention, the testing, and then the reviewing. And then this open source library allows someone to come and sign up um, and they can request something. So we'll talk about what that request form looks like if you already have somebody that's coming to mind of who might benefit from um, one of these devices. All right. So this, this shows you a, a perfect example of the AbleNet switch uh, on the left which is a great switch, but the cost is $115. So this is used a lot in our classrooms. Um, now from Makers Making Change, you can 3D print and uh, get all the material, and you build it for $5. So um, we, we've, we've come across a couple of times where these are nice to have in your like lending library closet, because we'll give out the $5 one to see if it actually works with the students. And maybe then, uh, I mean, not, I'm not saying the AbleNet is built any better, but maybe then if, if they're gonna need one for the, the home environment, uh, they'll, they'll do the AbleNet. But just 
you to realize the cost difference in this. And especially if you can make this and all you're doing is 3D printing something and some hot glue and a couple little uh, parts and it's, it's done for you. Yeah, and the nice thing is too is as disability providers, really ultimately just knowing that makers making change exists and being that uh, middleman for your patient or your student that you're working with, or maybe you have a family member that could be in need, um, ultimately knowing that this resource is available and being able to get that person in connection with a maker. Um, so Mark and I, um, like I said, had been able to be actually the state of Michigan's chapter leaders. We, so we started our own chapter and by being chapter leaders, we've been able to um, go out and do trainings for individuals. And so we've done trainings to individuals who are more on the maker side of things. So whether these are teachers of classrooms that are maker classrooms or STEM classrooms, we've been able to present to um, leaders of the robotics teams who serve as students who are learning all about building and making. But we've also um, been able to present to disability providers and so really our goal has been able to expand our chapter throughout the state so that as we um, are able to educate more people on the resources that are available that we can help um, meet the needs by having makers available that are ready to go to create some of these um, products for the individuals that are in need. Um, so this next slide that we're going to look at um, looks at just the pros and cons versus um, an open um of an open source or DIY AT. Um, so obviously the pros, it's definitely much more cost effective. Um, it allows you to be more customized for your individual specific needs and individuals that may not have access to um, an AT closet or um, AT providers or AT lenders um, because of where they are. Maybe they're in a more rural area. Um, this is going to allow them um, to gain access to it that way. Um, however, there's some cons. So there's obviously the warranty component, um, plus some of this you might have struggled to find somebody that has the skills or the abilities to create these. So I know I when I got into this, um, I had learned about the skill of soldering and switch adapted toys back when I went to school to be um, an occupational therapy assistant prior to um, getting my master's degree. But other than that, I had no, never touched a soldering gun outside of that. So um, this was definitely an area of interest, but a definitely an area of opportunity for me to learn um, and really build those skills. So, um, but when we look at those pros and cons, again, like the big thing is, is I know as background of being an outpatient therapist, I might say like, here's this button hook or here's this form of assistive technology. And it was great. And it was awesome to trial in the clinic, but insurance doesn't cover it. And then the individual would say, I don't have the money, you know, to purchase that or they, they're already getting all these medical bills or, or they're getting recommended multiple devices and they just don't really know where to prioritize. So this would allow somebody um, where that financial component um, plays a part to have access as well. But then also you're quick to buy things and it might be the new switch on the market. And so we think we're going to buy that, but that might not be the correct one for them. And so once you buy it, you might not be able to return it or things like that. So this can allow you to almost do trial and error and figure out what is the best switch, um, what is going to allow the individual to be most efficient and gain the most access. So on their website, um, on Makers Making Change, they have their assistive device library. So I did link the um, website right in there for you. And what that's going to do is it actually sorts it by um, topic. So there's activities of daily living, there's switches, there's mounting systems. And on there, um, you can go ahead and you can filter through that way. You can also also filter by cost, you can filter by build time. Um, if you don't see a project that meets the, the individual's needs, you can submit your ideas and they can um, link that to individuals that are more on the product development side of things and the engineers. Um, so it's a great spot for that. Also on their website, they have um, their forum, which their forum is a great way for users to collaborate, organize, it offers support and um, ideas to one another. So there's a lot of main categories that pop up on there. So um, for example, they might have, um, one that comes to mind was they were working on trying to find a solution for an individual who was trying to feed their dog from their wheelchair. Um, and so they were struggling with that. So they had made something using PVC piping and some awesome um, maker type skills. So it was awesome to see that. There's also things under there, um, under the community category that help you to um, 
get in connection with chapter leaders like us, as well as other members that are in the area. And um, if we host or organize local events, those will um, be listed on there as well. Um, so now I'm, I'm not going to go through all of these. I just wanted to make sure that you guys had these resources because I know when I graduated, I would you know, maybe it would be five years out. And then I was working with somebody. I'm like, oh my gosh, something from class sticks in my mind. And so I was a big PowerPoint person. So I had all my slides saved. So um, this is going to be a great resource or tool going forward for you. So um, there's a lot of different switches and we could spend all day talking about all of these different switches, but the reality is that maybe you won't use a majority of these or may never see any of these. So it's just knowing that they do exist. Um, and then even when you think that the right solution doesn't exist. Um, think further along those lines because obviously we've got a ton of different makers and developers and um, they're awesome and there's no um, end to the possibilities. And that's that. one of the nice things about this is uh, you can really request a customized switch from makers making change. So there might not be one out on the market, but they might be able to develop one or print one for you. So. Uh, yeah, don't don't give up on, uh, you know, if, if you're like, oh, this is going to be a tough one. There's there's always going to be a way out there. So um, this first one is a custom grip switch. So you can see that. And so um, there actually is just allowing and that that's allowing you to customize it using a variety of things like Instamorph, which is um, another product that is like moldable plastic and you can they look, you can see in the picture that they're using it almost like as an, on a ring finger on one or a whole hand switch, depending on what the individual's abilities are. This next one's that raindrop switch that he had mentioned earlier that's comparable to that mini cup switch through AbleNet. Um, so on each of these slides, it's going to um, show you what the product is. These are the products that are in the open source library through Makers Making Change. It's going to tell you what the function of it is, what the approximate costs are, what it requires, and then in each of these um, slides, there's the actual direct link to the website. If you click on that link, it's going to give you directions. It's going to give you the 3D print files. Um, if you don't have access to a 3D printer and you're interested in trying to build one of these, um, that's something that you guys can sign up through Makers Making Change through the forum. Um, and we'd love you to do that because we can get you in connection with individuals that would be willing to 3D print the parts for you as well. Um, so there's this light touch switch, which is comparable to um, this one um, through AbleNet. So this is the micro light switch. And what this one is, is it allows um, the individual to barely touch it. So very, very light pressure or force through the finger. Um, something like this on the market is around $90. Um, something through Makers Making Change that is made using those 3D printed parts is about $10. Um, and that includes um, not only the parts to be sent out, um, but I've also have created some of these at events that we've done shipped individuals out of state for under ten dollars so which is awesome uh the, the one thing i wanted to point out in this uh this slide here is this switch right here that's all 3d printed but the cool thing that uh, makers making make change did is the the little uh axle that goes in here is actually a, a part of a pen so like the to keep the cost so low like you actually like are using other things to make that switch it just it's it's, it's very uh very MacGyverish. So this next one um, is actually just using a product from Amazon, which is pretty cool. So they just purchased um, this four pack of switches. And what they did is these ones are just almost like buzzers or sound. Um, they, they normally just make sounds, but now it's going to make it almost a switch that can plug into something. So it gives you the um, ability to create that input um, for the device using that switch jack and um, the links to how to create those are on there. Um, being able to, there's this, a round flexure switch. And so this one's similar to what we call a jelly bean switch, which is ultimately a smaller version of that Big Mac switch that we've talked a lot about today. Um, so just smaller in diameter. Um, same thing, something like that's going to be well into like the 70s or 80s as far as cost goes commercially. Something like this um, 3D printed is going to be more around that $10 mark. Um, so like I said, there's a variety of switchers that are on here. This one's very ultimately similar to those jelly bean switches as well. Um, there's what's called an open rocker switch. Um, this one, um, there's quite a bit as far as rocker switches go out on the market. And that one allows someone to use more of like supination, pronation, and some of those more distal movements. 
There's an open wobble switch. I love these um, type of switches for someone who is using more gross motor movements um, or if they are having to use something other than their arm, like their um, head or their knees to help activate it. Um, the nice thing about them is if someone is very um, apraxic or has a lot of uncontrolled movements, um, they can use those for um to be able to access the switch. Um, and then there's this large lever switch, the same thing. This one's cool because you can actually adjust the level of sensitivity up or down depending on the individual's amount of pressure that they can push down through their fingers. We have what's called a resistive switch, um, resistive touch switch. And so this one um, is actually the same thing, very, very light touch that needs to be um, applied to be able to access the switch a proximity switch. So these are really nice for an individual who struggles with maybe um, the con motor control to access it accurately each time. It allows um, basically switch activation even if they're approximating um, somewhere near the switch. And you can adjust the sensitivity on that. So that one's similar to um, the honeybee or the candy corn switch that are made through AbleNet. Um, when we look at sip and puff blow switches, those are obviously very, very, very involved. Um, um, in more complex switches. And so those ones allow someone to use their inhale and their exhale to be able to access the switch. Um, this is actually just the switch that um, is almost like the interface that goes in um, between, but there is a wonderful sip and puff switch through um, Makers Making Change that is called their Lip Sync. And that one is um, about $200 in parts in assembly, um, comparable to about an $8,000 switch on the market. Um, so I've often said the word switch interface, and so I do want to touch on what that is. So um, we can use a battery interrupter to help um, to control that on and off for those um, toys, those activities that are out there. However, there is also external um, interfaces that can be used. Like I mentioned, you can use that Bluetooth switch. Um, so what that does is it's going to allow and something um, to basically be the middle band between the toy the switch, and then that's going to allow that um, switch to be plugged into the port. So um, this one on the market is a tiny switchy, but um, you can see right on the front, um, the switches can be plugged in directly into there. There's also a 3D printed um, switch interface box through Makers Making Change that allows um, an individual an option all the way from four to 10 switch inputs. So you could have a variety of switches um, depending on what you're trying to work on with the individual. Um, back to those mounting options. So similar to what Mark was mentioning earlier, those adapted um, cars or the Go Baby Go project is kind of similar to what you see in number three. Um, you can see that that switch is around that headrest. And so somebody would be able to move their head backward to be able to power and operate the toy um, and allow them to drive around. Um, that first one that you see is actually a mounting system that we use quite a bit. Um, and that um, is going to be on um, our next couple slides, um, you're going to see it's that modular hosing. And so that allows, um, it's really bendable and it allows you to lock in a variety of pieces um, so that the switch can be put at a different surface height. So maybe the individual's in their wheelchair, um, but they can only lift their arm just a little bit. Maybe their um, device needs to be positioned lower, or maybe they're using more of like elbow and more distal movements. Maybe their switch needs to be provided um, prompted to them outside of their um, wheelchair. So it can be very rigid, but it can also be very flexible depending on which pieces that you put in. So it's super nice. Um, but there's also things as simple as Velcro. So we use Velcro sometimes, or we use Dyson sometimes to be able to put a communication device or an iPad or a switch on someone's um, uh, wheelchair or um, the chair that they're positioned in so that they can access that. Um, sometimes 3M command strips are utilized. So don't think just on a wall, but they can also be used for um, mounting a device on someone's um, lap tray or things like that. So this next slide, you kind of see the lap tray um, and that's often positioned in front of an individual um, with their switches on um, the tray table. And so um, things like the Velcro or things like the 3M strips could be used to help maintain or stabilize those switches so they're not sliding and um, moving everywhere. 
Um, alternative option for that modular hosing can be camera arms, which is really cool. So this is something 15 to $50 on the market. Um, so often they're just used by people that are taking photography, but they um, are a lower cost for someone if they are looking for a mounting system for their device. Um, that lock line or modular hosing that I had mentioned, which is awesome, um, is pretty inexpensive. So it's about $15 um, for the tools to assemble it and then um, about $350 for each of the connector pieces. So just depending on how long you need it. You can kind of see on the bottom picture with the iPhone, there's a clamp. So this can be really moved anywhere. So I've seen kiddos. Um, I had a girl that was um, I was seeing in the home because she was homebound and she was unfortunately reaching um, like end stages of life. And so her only thing she wanted to be able to do was be on her phone. She was a teenager. And so um, this was something that I actually had used the clamp and it was connected to her IV pole. And then I had, um, it was able to add in some lock line so that she could still access her cell phone um, from her bed. Um, PVC piping has been a big area um, as far as an awesome maker type alternative um, to be able to do switch mounting and um, something that we're definitely still exploring a little bit more on our end. Um, and But these obviously are so much more um, cost effective and can be really customized to meet that individual's needs. So that first um, picture that you see up on top is actually the mount for that lip sync or that sip and puff blow switch that we talked about um, and then it would allow some someone um, access to it at a desk. Um, same thing with the second picture. It's actually just mounting that jelly bean switch. Um, and that could be added to a desk. It could be added to a wheelchair. It could be um, added to, um, you know, someone's chair. Um, so the options are endless um, depending on what that individual needs. And for that bottom one, they're just using zip ties and PVC pipe. I mean, mm -hmm. it's very, very basic. Um, and so the next one's just kind of going a little bit more on clamps. So all of the links to all of these are going to be in um, the slides. Like I said, when I come out um, to the classroom for your guys' lab day related to all of this, I'm going to bring out a variety of the switches and have them hooked up to um, some things so that you guys can explore a little bit more and get and be able to um, ask questions then as well. Um, and we're also going to um, be um, diving a little bit deeper into what's called the Makey Makey. So I'm excited to share with you guys how we used a $50 product um, ultimately as a switch um, interface for a variety of activities and a way to um, promote gamifying therapy. So super excited um, to share that with you guys. And we appreciate your time and allowing us to present this information to you today. And if you, uh, if you want to see, you know, what we're doing and where we're at, um, we're, we're both on Twitter. So uh, we try to tweet as much as possible and makers making change is a great resource. I mean, you guys are all going into this field. So I would uh, highly recommend that Twitter become your, uh, I believe they call it your personal learning network, and it's a, a great platform. And we, uh, we, you know, truly appreciate you guys. So uh, thank you, Sagan Valley. Uh, next time. <laughs>